you know, after a time of uh, worship and praise like that, it's almost uh, fitting just to say, let's just go home. <coughs> um, no such luck. So, if you've got your Bibles, turn to 1 Peter chapter 2. And hang on to that for a few moments. There was a 54-year-old woman that went into the hospital because she was having a heart attack. While on the operating table in the hospital, she had one of those near-death experiences, and she saw God, and she asked God, is this it? Is this my time? And God said, oh, no, oh, no, you've got 43 more years. Well, she recovered from her heart attack, and she decided since she had a little longer, she'd, uh, she'd do some, some improvements. So she had a tummy tuck, and she had a facelift, and she had some liposuction. She uh, changed the color of her hair, got some extensions, and even brightened up her teeth. And finally, after all of these different procedures and surgeries, she was finally released from the hospital. And the day that she left the hospital, she was crossing the street, was hit by an ambulance, and was killed. She stood before God, and she simply demanded this, God, what's up with that? You told me I had 43 more years to live. Why didn't you save me from the ambulance? And God looked at her and went, huh, I didn't recognize you. (laughs) Happy anniversary, Cornerstone. (laughs) Happy anniversary. You know, for 11 and a half years, this uh, congregation met at Glendale Elementary School. Uh, They were super gracious to us. And for the last 11 and a half years, we've met here in this facility. So half of our time in a school, half of our time here. And, And often when people talk about the church, you'll hear them referring to a building or they'll refer to the campus. I'm going to church and they are thinking of the building but please understand that this building is just a building it's not the church who is the church we are and that there's proof of that throughout of the scripture let me give you two of those instances because in acts chapter 5 you may remember uh, that this was a time of of great persecution and it said the church was in great fear well that makes sense if the church is people it doesn't make sense if the church is a building And then in Acts chapter 8, you may remember here Saul, who becomes later on the Apostle Paul and is the Apostle to the Gentiles, he is going around destroying the church. Now, he's not tearing down buildings, he's doing what? He's killing Christians, throwing them in prison and separating them from their families. And so this, on this honor anniversary, I want to talk about the church. I want to talk about the ecclesia. I want to talk about the called out ones. I want to talk about the assembly. I want to talk about God's church. You see, the New Testament uses a lot of different descriptive terms to describe what the church looks like and what it should be. For instance, it's also it's described at one point or several times as a family. And we're all brothers and sisters in this large spiritual family. And of course, God is our father above all things. At times, the church is also described as a kingdom, and we're all citizens as part of that kingdom, and Jesus, of course, is the king of the kingdom. The church is sometimes described as a body. This tells us two things. It talks about diversity and unity, that as my body is unified in purpose, there's different aspects of my body that do different things, and so we all have a role to play. We all have gifts, and we should use those gifts to build up the kingdom. But today, I want to use a different example. I want to use the example that we find in our main text in Peter and in Ephesians about how the church is a building, with every single Christian being a living stone that's built into that edifice. 1 Peter chapter 2, I'm going to read verses 4 and 5. We'll be reading more verses from there and then more in Ephesians 2. But 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 4 and 5 says, As you come to him, the living stone, rejected by humans, but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into a spiritual house. Why? To be a holy priesthood offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. There was a Spartan king in ancient Greece who was bragging to a visiting monarch about the mighty walls of Sparta. And this other monarch was looking around thinking, well, I don't see any of those walls. Where are they at? And eventually he got up the courage to ask the king, where are these mighty walls? I want to see these mighty walls of Sparta. 
It just so happened that there was two or three soldiers in the Spartan army, well-trained, well-disciplined soldiers passing by at that moment. And the king with great pride and with exclamation said, See, there, they are the walls of Sparta. And in the same way that the ruler of Sparta looked at his soldiers as the wall, it's the same with you and I that we are to be built into the house of God, into his building, into his kingdom. As each of the Spartan soldiers was a brick in the wall, so we are viewed by God as living stones, part of his kingdom that makes it strong. Paul uses the very same image in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 19 and following. He says, consequently, You are no longer foreigners or strangers, he says, but you are fellow citizens with God's people and also members of the household, out of his household, built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself as the chief cornerstone. In him, the whole building is joined together and and, and it rises. It rises to become a holy temple to the Lord And in him, you too are being built together to become the dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. I want to point out four things about this building that you and I are part of. Here's the first thing, and that is that there is supposed to be unity in the building. Unity in the building. Now, Paul here in Ephesians uses three different descriptions when he talks about what the church is supposed to be. So he starts with the idea of citizenship. Then he goes to household or family, and then he lands on the idea of the building. Now, after you told me that I'm a citizen in God's kingdom, after you tell me I'm a member of God's family, for you to tell me that I'm just a living rock doesn't sound very good. It doesn't sound like it's going the right direction. It feels impersonal. It feels cold, but yet it's not. Paul is going more intimate, he's going deeper, he's growing closer together. See, he's stressing the closeness of the members of the very household of God as they are interconnected together. Let me illustrate. I live a thousand miles from my mom and dad and my sisters and their husbands and nieces and nephews, all right? And some of you probably are the same way. You live many miles. Some of you have family on the other side of the pond, all right? Some of you are thousands of miles. Some of you are not uh, extremely close to your family. Some of you don't really talk to your family that much. See, families can be scattered, Families can be scattered, and in the same way citizens in a kingdom can be scattered, but in a building, the stones are joined together. The stones are on top of each other. They're close in proximity. You see, the church draws us together. It draws us together. It bonds us together in a way that really nothing else can. Now, oftentimes, we have, uh, we have little in common. Those of us who call ourselves brothers and sisters, we come from different economic situations, different educational backgrounds. We come from different ethnicities. We come from different environments. Everything about us screams, you shouldn't be together. You guys are way too different. And yet there's a bond that we find in Jesus Christ and the love that we have through him. Jesus himself is the architect. Jesus himself is the builder that brings us together and joins us in close fellowship. You may remember the terms Jew and Gentile. These are two groups of people. The Gentiles came from the Jewish line, but had married outside of their faith, and there grew, um, well, let's say a little bit of disdain and hostility between these groups. In fact, at the time of Jesus, we could truly and honestly say that these groups of people hated one another. So what happened when Jews and Gentiles came to know Jesus Christ? Look what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. He says, but now in Christ Jesus, there's the glue, you who were once far away have been brought near. Again, not because they thought, oh, let's just all get along. No, it says it's by the blood of Jesus Christ, for he himself, he is our peace who has made the two groups one and has destroyed the barrier, the dividing wall of hostility. See, in Jesus Christ, the church, no matter how distinctively we are different from one another, we can be united. We can be together, not because of who we are, but because of who he is. 
that we all underneath the shed blood of Jesus. Oh, Jesus takes every single stone that is used and, and, and he maybe he, he knocks some of the pieces off and chisels other people's pieces. Maybe he sands some of those stones. Maybe he smooths those rocks so that every single one of those is ready and fits with great precision, snugly and beautifully into this great edifice, this great wall, this great building that we call the house of God, the place where God would dwell. And together, man, we form a building. And it's not just any building. This is not just a normal, run-of-the-mill, everyday building. No, this is the temple where God himself resides. It is his house. It is certainly not our house. Oh, these words, they would have caused the Jewish people to think about the temple in Jerusalem. That temple which had been built and then destroyed and then built and then destroyed again and then built again. They would have thought about that. Now the Gentiles, they may have thought about a different temple. Maybe they thought about the temple Diana in the, the city of Ephesus. Or maybe they thought about one of the other many temples where some of their, their deities, their, their idols, their false gods would be worshipped. But as Stephen pointed out, the very first martyr, the one who died for Jesus Christ first in the New Testament, in Acts chapter 7, verse 48, the Most High does not live in houses made by human hands. Rather, His temple is where? Right here, isn't it? It's in our hearts. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We are where God resides. And I don't know about you, but that is both an awesome thought an absolutely terrifying thought that God himself would choose to live in me. Oh, what the glory of that is. Oh, we are not just any old building. No, we are a building that has the purpose of housing the most high God. And so this building that each of us have, we are the church. We are to be the holy temple before God and live for him. Now, if we're going to have unity in this building, then we've got to also, second, we've got to have a blueprint any building that's built has to be designed with a blueprint. You may have heard about the Michigan contractor that was building a two-story house, and the first story went really, really well. They followed the plans, everything fit, all the stuff in the lumber yard was exact, it was wonderful. When they got to the second floor, everything that went right on the first floor went wrong on the second floor. Nothing fit, nothing worked. All the things, the supplies from the lumber yard weren't to the specifications, and it just didn't work. Then they found the reason why there was so much trouble. They had two different sets of blueprints. And when they finally got rid of the wrong set of blueprints, well, then the house was being able to be constructed. It was built solidly, it was built beautifully, and it was finished just fine. You need to understand that we only have one set of blueprints, and that's God's word. It is his word. It's not our word, it's not what Cornerstone says, it's not what the shepherds, it's not what Kenton and Steve says, it is what God's word says. Now, think about this. When the Jewish people, when they were constructing the tabernacle way back hundreds and hundreds of years before, you may remember in the wilderness, God gave them very explicit details on how that tabernacle was to be constructed. It was to be so high and so tall and so wide. They were having a, a specific number of wooden poles and they were laid out in very distinctive ways. They were also to have the certain number of curtains, certain colors, certain fabrics. Everything had to be done exactly as God intended it to be. And the Jewish people, they followed those rules and that, that instruction very uh, clearly because they knew this was going to be where the presence of God resided. The Shekinah presence of God would be in that place. Now, later on, of course, we know it was Solomon. He built the permanent structure. We call it the temple in Jerusalem. And again, it was built per God's instructions. And they got craft, uh, a skilled craftsmen who came to build this. And it says that everything fit so well that they didn't even have to use any chisels or hammers when they were on the construction site, according to 1 Kings chapter 6, verse 7. Now, I don't know about you, but I've built things before, and a hammer is a very useful, oh, that will fit now. That's going to fit, you know, or a chisel, something to make something fit. Maybe it's like when we gain weight and try to fit in our pants or our dress. But anyway, so, so there are things, and, and can you imagine that these construction workers, they knew they were building the temple of God, and they did it with precision so that everything fit exactly right when they got to the construction site. Well, folks, if we are to be part of God's building, then there has to be a blueprint, and that blueprint is God's word. 
Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. All Scripture is God-breathed. Watch the word for that. God-breathed means what? Inspired. Inspired. And it's useful. It's useful for teaching and rebuking and correcting and training in righteousness. Now, here's the reason. Here's the outcome. So that the servant of God, that's you and I, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. See, everything that we say and do has to be based upon God's word. We seek to do that as a congregation, but individually, you and I need to seek to do that in our lives as well. You see, if we ever leave his blueprint and we begin to build our lives based upon our own whims and our own desires, it's going to be like that Michigan contractor trying to build a house with two sets of blueprints. It'll only end up in a mess. We have to follow his blueprint. Here's the third thing about the building that God's building is never completed. It's never completed. Let, let me illustrate. Uh, Sarah, uh, yeah, I thought I had a middle name, but I don't. Sarah Winchester was the heir to the uh, fortune of the Winchester Rifle Com Company. And when she received her inheritance, she received $20 million and an additional $1,000 as a salary every single day of her life. Now, that's a lot of money today, but it was an enormous sum of money back in the late 1800s. Sarah decided she was going to move to California, I guess like the Beverly Hillbillies, and she bought an eight-room uh, farmhouse with an adjoining 160 acres of land. She then hired 16 different carpenters to work for her. And for 38 years, those crews worked 24 hours a day, obviously in shifts, to build her a mansion for Sarah. I want you to listen to the mansion. When she died, the house covered six acres of land, had six kitchens, 13 bathrooms, 40 staircases, 47 fireplaces, 52 skylights, 467 doors, 10,000 windows, 160 rooms, and you might as well throw in a bell tower in there too. I mean, what's a house without a bell tower, right? But you know what? Sarah never saw the house completed. She died before the house was finished. And I think that there is an analogy to us as the church here. That accurately describes God's building because it is continuing to be build, being built for the last 2,000 years. Everyone that comes to Christ is another stone in this wall. Every time someone comes to Jesus Christ, it's another stone in the wall, it's another fireplace, it's another room being added, it's another skylight, it's another window in some spiritual way. That building is never, ever completed. It's always growing because more and more people, as Acts chapter 2 says, are being added to the church, added to the body. About this church, here's what Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. It's built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets. Now see, these people in that first century, they were the ones who first were proclaiming the good news, which is called also the what? The gospel of Jesus Christ. And they were the ones who led people to Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 2 uh, was the day of Pentecost and thousands came to the Lord. Later though, more people did the same thing. And then more people, it's like different strata in the rock. More and more people were added. In fact, listen to how Paul describes it in 1 Corinthians 3. He says in verse 6, he says, I planted the seed... Apollos watered, but God, has brought, had brought, but God has made it grow. And then verses 9 and 10, For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building, and by the grace that God has given me, I laid a foundation as a wise builder. And, here, catch this, and someone else is building it now, but each of us should build with care. So think about this. Paul established the church in Corinth, but after he left, Apollos took over. He became the, the preacher, one of the, the lead uh, shepherds there in that church, and he led that. But after Apollos, there was someone else that came along and built upon the foundation that Paul and Apollos had led. I think Will Allen uh, uh, Dromgoul uh, wrote the poem Bridge Builder, and it really, really focuses upon this idea very well. He says, an old man traveled on a lone highway, came at the evening time cold and gray, to a chasm vast and deep and wide, through which was flowing a sullen tide. The old man the old, man, uh, the old man crossed in the twilight dim. The sullen stream held no fears for him. 
but he turned when safe on the other side and built a bridge to span the tide. Old man, cried a fellow pilgrim near, the, the, uh, you are wasting your time building a bridge right here. Your journey will end with the, with the closing day. You never again will pass this way. You have crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build this bridge at even time? Oh, the builder lifted his old gray head. Friend, in the path I've come, he said. There follows after me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. The stream which has, has, been, known, has been not for me to that fair-haired youth may pitfall be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I build this bridge for him. So my question is, who are you building a bridge for? If you are living a life that honors Jesus Christ, the question is, who are you building a bridge for? A spiritual bridge, a discipleship type of bridge so that they may follow in your footsteps and maybe not have some of the pitfalls that you've dealt with and learned from and grown from. Building a bridge so that others might cross safely along life's journey. See, that's part of our initiative called Next Wave, our three-year initiative to dive further where we want to build a bridge so that people might come to Jesus Christ, but we also want to go deeper in our faith, that's discipleship, so that people might follow in our footsteps and we might train them as we have been trained, and then we need to reach our next generation to dive younger to bring them to Christ. Here's the last, and it's, it's really the most important aspect of this idea of the building, and that's that Jesus is our cornerstone. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 11 says, For now no one lays any foundation other than the one that's already been laid, which is Jesus Christ. And then add to that what Peter says in chapter 2 of 1 Peter, verses 6 and following. For in Scripture it says, See, I lay a stone in Zion, a chosen and precious cornerstone, and the one who trusts in him will never be put to shame. Now to you, now to you who believe this stone is, this stone is precious, Here's the contrast. But to those who do not believe, the stone that the builders, re the, the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And then listen to what it says here. A stone that causes people to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Now that sounds really odd. But there's a contrast by how we see Jesus. Do we stand upon him? Do we build our lives upon him? Or do we look at him with disdain? And therefore, that rock causes us to stumble and fall. You see, here P Peter, he, he quotes from the book of Isaiah chapter 28 and the book of I, uh, Psalm chapter 118. And he points out that Jesus, while he was the one chosen by God to be the Savior of the world, was rejected by the Jewish people and the world he came to save. He wasn't the kind of Messiah they wanted, and so they stumbled over him. See, the rock that they, that they, uh, uh, that they considered uh, a nuisance to them, well, that was the one that God chose and was precious and would come to save this entire world. The story is told about, and it's a true story, about how out in the West, many pilgrims, many uh, pioneers, they used the Oregon Trail as they went out West to settle their land. And when they got to, a, uh, to the eastern slope of the Rocky Mountains, there was kind of a wide stream, and so they two-stepped across the stream. There was this large rock right in the middle of the stream, and they used it to kind of get over the stream. It was just a, a stepping stone. Well, years passed and other pioneers came and they settled in that little valley area. Some even built cabins, strung up fences, plowed the land, and they made their homes there. One pioneer actually built a cabin right next to the stream. But he had a problem. His front door, because of the wind in the valley, kept flapping. And so he pulled that rock out of the middle of the stream and set it on his porch and it acted as a doorstop for his house for several decades. Years passed, the railroads came out there, more people settled out west, cities were built, thousands of people came in that way. And a nephew of this old pioneer, he went back east to study geology at a famous university. 
Later on, he came home to uh, have some vacation, and lo and behold, what was sitting on his uncle's front porch was not just a rock, not just a stepping stone, not just a doorstop, but it was a chunk of pure gold. In fact, it was in the history books as the largest lump nugget of gold that's ever been found on the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains worth millions of dollars. Now, it was there for three generations. Three generations, people looked at it, maybe as a nuisance, maybe they tripped over it, maybe they just stepped on it, maybe they just used it for, to hold their door shut. But it was only the nephew who realized the great value in that stone. And there are few people that see the value in Jesus as the cornerstone. Most people see him as a liar or a lunatic or a legend, but we see him as our Lord and our Savior and our God. Oh, many look to Jesus Christ in the very same way and they stumble because of that. He's not the kind of God they want to serve. He's not the type of Lord that they want to submit to. And so they stumble over him. But at the very same time, he is the precious cornerstone and there's none like him. He's the foundation of God's building. He's who we build our lives upon. See, you and I, we're just another brick in the wall. But Jesus is the capstone, the cornerstone, the foundation of the church where we build our lives. And so I would ask this final question, why are we built into God's house? Why does he want us to be part of his kingdom, to be part of his building? See, you see, a lot of people think that church is for us. I come to church for me, what I get out of it. Nope. Now, if you get something out of it, we're glad for that, but that's a byproduct. That's not the reason you come to church. That's not a reason that you are part of God's household. Look what 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10 says. He says, but you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession. Why? That you may declare the praise of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Oh, once, once you were a people, but now you are a people of God. And once you had no, not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Folks, you are here because you are to declare the praises of God. That's why part of our vision statement is to bring glory to God, to declare his praise, that my life each and every day should be a testimony to who God is, and it should declare things not about me at all. It should declare the praise of the God that I worship, the God that I serve. So the question is, does that describe your life? Does your lifestyle declare the praises of of God. The Taj Mahal is one of the most beautiful buildings that's ever been constructed. It was actually built after the Emperor Shah Jahan's wife died. He was grief stricken, he was devastated, and so he resolved in his mind to build this wonderful temple that would act as her tomb, as her, as her place of burial. Her coffin was placed in the middle of this very large open field, and the construction began and continued basically all 360 degrees <clears throat> around that coffin. But the weeks of the construction turned into months, and months even turned into a few years. No longer did the, uh, uh, did the emperor mourn his wife's death. Now he was consumed with building this magnificent, no expenses barred kind of structure. He mourned her less and got consumed so much with that that one day as he was walking along the construction site from one side to the other, his leg bumped into a wooden box. He brushed the dust off of his leg and then ordered a couple co-workers to destroy and get rid of that box. He had just gotten rid of the coffin of his late wife. I want you to think about that. The one to whom this temple was being constructed was forgotten. It was no more. And yet the temple was still built. And that's the danger of the church as well. The same thing can happen in the church, that if we're not careful, that we can again uh, come to find the purpose in just ourselves, that this church is all about us, it's for us, it's for me, it's about what I want, it's about what pleases me, it's about what makes me happy, but folks, that's not it at all. It's about our cornerstone, and it's only about our cornerstone. It's only about him so that we might bring more people to build that edifice, that great grand building, the house of God into a great structure that all will see. 
Peter calls us back to our purpose. He says we need to claim the praises of God. The Greek word actually is actually the word advertise. So when it says to proclaim his praises, it means to advertise. And I will tell you, we live in a very dark and very evil world where it needs the light of Jesus Christ. And that's exactly what the scripture says. That we now have, we've been taken from the darkness into his glorious light. And so now our purpose, our job is to advertise his greatness so that the world may see him and not us at all. You know, when people here come to Cornerstone, they shouldn't look around and say, you know what, this is a really nice building. It's really, really nice. No, people shouldn't be drawn to this and say, you know what, you guys are a whole bunch of really nice people. You know, that's why I come to church, because it's just a bunch of nice people. People should be drawn to us, and what they should say is, boy, you serve a great God. Let us declare his praise. Pray with me. Father in heaven, help us to realize that we are not the cornerstone, that we're not building this, this edifice, this church. We're not growing its numbers based upon uh, any of us at all. We're only building it based upon the person of Jesus Christ, who is again the one who is the Messiah, the King, the Lord. He is God in flesh. He's Emmanuel. He is our atonement for sin. He is the Savior of this world. And so we want to declare His praises. We want to declare His glory and not take any for ourselves. Oh God, help us to act as a reflector, just to reflect the glory of Christ in our lives. Help us live by that blueprint. Help us be united as that one purpose. Help us again to continue to grow the church that it will never, ever cease to continue to expand and grow. And help us never to forget that our foundation is the Lord Jesus Christ himself. We pray in his blessed name. Amen. We're going to extend a, a time where people might want to make a decision, whether it's for the first time or whether you want to come back to him. Maybe you need to come to Jesus for the first time and, and you want to decide, hey, listen, Jesus is who I want to build my life. I want to make sure he's the cornerstone. And so come and believe in him. Repent of your sins. Be immersed even this very day. If you've done that, you're already part of God's family. Maybe you want to become part of this family here, the, the small C church. Or maybe you want to rededicate your life to the purposes of following his blueprints and declaring the praises of our God. Or maybe you'd just like us to pray for you. Would you stand with me, please? We're going to sing the song Cornerstone. We're going to sing the whole song because it's just a great song. If you have a decision to make, then come on up. Or you could talk with someone afterwards back in the back room. If you just want to worship the Lord, raise your hands, close your eyes. But let's worship our cornerstone as we close our service today. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Let's sing it out, church. Christ of
want you to lift your voices. I want you to sing it to Jesus. Christ alone. know John and Barbara Lauber. Uh, they are uh, family friends uh, with Dan and Karen who are already part of this congregation. They have worshiped with us for quite a, uh, quite a few months. Uh, a we're, year, we're home. A well, a, a year and a half. Uh, we've got to spend some time together. These are people who already know Jesus Christ. They have served him with their life. Uh, there, there's a really cool story for both of them, but they have seen in you something that they would like to become part of. They would like to serve the great cornerstone here alongside you. And so they are today becoming part of the body of Christ here at Cornerstone. And we welcome you guys. I always ask people, would you like to say anything? You don't have to, though. They're still saying not me. Something I see in each and every of you, right? Cornerstone. You're really beautiful. And I think what I got out of this the most today, you're beautiful, but I see God, okay? Amen. And God is what you reflect to him. He puts out in the world. Okay? Amen. I what you're telling. See, a couple guys from Arizona once. <laughs> and the world, and you can go on, but thank you for being part oh. of this. And uh, Matt was really happy I came today because I drove up with my car. <laughs> <laughs> we love you guys. Amen, amen, amen. Great to have you guys. Thank you, John. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Again, make sure that you introduce yourself several times to John and Barbara because, again, they've got lots of names to learn. You have two. So uh, make sure you introduce yourself to them over the next week, few weeks and months, uh, but welcome them as part of the congregation here. We're so grateful that you joined us for this, our anniversary. Again, it's cool to see lots of folks here to celebrate the Lord. Uh, and as we leave this place, we're going to do two things. We're going to bring glory to God and people to Jesus. Have a great week.